If you had to make a list of the most famous people in the world, probably defined by you know their name by looking at a photo, then pretty well near the top of that list would be the American presidents. In fact, I'd venture to suggest that a number of them would make that list. Barack Obama, George Bush, both of them, President Kennedy, and maybe even Abraham Lincoln. Now, even in this part of the world, American presidents hold our interest. Now, go back a few years and President Ronald Reagan was in charge. Now, you might remember his most famous words, Mr Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, the wall did get torn down and President Reagan, nicknamed the Great Communicator, left the presidency well-loved and well-respected. Now, the years immediately following his presidency gave my next guest her job. Peggy Grandy was President Reagan's executive assistant for nearly 10 of those years. And that provided her with an unprecedented level of contact, not only with President Reagan, but also to some of the world leaders of the day. I chatted with Peggy at a conference in Australia where she was one of the guest speakers. And I began by suggesting she'd done what most of us had not. That is, she'd been in the room with an American president. I have, I have many, many times over the course of a decade and then really 27 years of my life being connected to President and Mrs. Reagan. So can you remember the first time that you saw the president? Yeah. Well, I remember even as a young person watching him on TV and there was something about the way he came through the lens into your living room and spoke directly to you and you felt important to him. You felt heard and valued by him, which is crazy because here you are a young person looking through a TV, but he had a, a beautiful way of connecting. So when I was in college, before I started working for him, he came and actually spoke at my university. And I remember sitting way up in the rafters of our basketball arena that we had and seeing this little tiny Ronald Reagan on the stage and for me it was the most thrilling moment of my life. I had already always been this kid who loved politics and government and presidents and so even to just to be in the same venue as him was a thrilling moment. Never imagining in just a few short months I would regularly sit across a table from him like Please. this. So that's when you first saw him but can you remember when you first met him? I will never forget the first moment I met him. And it was a little bit embarrassing, but I've written about it in my book, so I've had to get over the humiliation of it. But I was in his office. I had just interviewed for a job there. I never, I don't know why it never occurred to me that he might actually work in his office. <laughs> so at the end of my interview, I'm sitting in the lobby and out the doors open and out walks Ronald Reagan right toward me. And I'm gonna be honest, I kind of panicked. I didn't know what to do. And so I stood up as if the flag were passing by and put my hand over my heart. I get it. <laughs> Just out of respect and wanted to be very non-threatening and never could have imagined that from that crazy, ridiculous moment um, that I would go on to have such a career with him. And, and even though I got very comfortable working with him, I never lost that formality and that respect of, he had been the president of the United States. Well, you know him as the president and also as a man. I guess in our part of the world, we know him or knew him as a, a movie star yeah. <laughs> who became the president. We think only in America could that happen. Is that true? <laughs> only in America could that happen? It is true. I don't know about only, but probably one of the few places. I always find that funny, though, because they talk about him being, you know, president of the Screen Actors Guild and being in Hollywood and then becoming president. And somehow they overlook the fact that he was governor of the state of California for eight years. And California, if it was his own country, would be the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. And so somehow they like to mock him in a way. Oh, he was this cowboy actor that became president. Um, but they discount the fact that he had great executive experience running the state of California before then. Did he have a Christian faith? He absolutely did. He was raised by a mother who was a tremendous woman of faith. He was raised in the heartland of America in the Midwest. And even though he went on to leave the Midwest, he took those heartland values with him. Um, his mother was an amazing woman who taught him to believe that God has a plan for everything. And regardless of circumstances, things will work out in the end. And Ronald Reagan's life story is quite surprising in the sense that we picture him on the world stage, but he was really born to a very poor family. Um, his father was an alcoholic, and by most, most estimations, you would have thought this poor kid will never amount to anything. So how is it that he did make it to the White House? Mm -hmm. What drove him? 
Yeah. You know, he had a great sense of self and a great sense of country. He loved our nation. He loved America. He loved the people of the nation. He had a he had a heart for the heartland, for the hardworking people, not just the coastal elites. And I think he just surrendered himself to God's plan. You know, he he always felt like he was doing exactly what God had called him to do. And if you were doing what God called you to do, then you were equals. And so I think by allowing himself to just step into the next door that God opened for him, um, he was willing to do that. And he was, he was actually kind of a little bit of an introverted, shy, quiet person, but he was willing to give voice to people who didn't have a voice. And I think that's really what drove him. He felt like he had a platform and an opportunity to really help and change the face of our nation and in many ways the world with his voice. Sometimes you think of him as being the president who had some really phenomenal one-liners. Mm -hmm. And in, as a consequence of that, you forget that he did some amazing things as well. Is, is, that, is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, absolutely. He was the king of one-liners. I, I mean, if he was on social media, I would have loved to follow his Twitter feed because what Ronald Reagan could say in 160 characters would have been laughable and just wonderful. But he always used his words to inspire and to motivate and to stay on point, to challenge people. So he he, he did get the, that part right, but he also got the big picture right as well. And he was a man of action. He was not one to just talk about things, even though he was the great communicator. He was unafraid to sometimes take unpopular action when he was convicted that it was the right thing. In fact, most people don't realize that when he stood at the Brandenburg Gate and challenged Gorbachev to tear down the wall, the State Department, his speech writers, his close circle of advisors had all said, don't say it. It's too confrontational. It's too dangerous. You're going to be this crazy cowboy starting World War III. And, but he was a man of conviction, and he knew he needed to say that. And aren't we grateful as a world that he stuck to his convictions and said it in spite of overwhelming resistance to him saying that? Do you know where the line came from, don't tear down this wall? Or did it just come out of his head? He had written it into his speech many times and it kept being taken out of his speech by his speech writers. And he kept putting it back in. And so when he stood there at the gate, that's what he said. So he, he was human, wasn't he? Like, yeah. Okay, so did he take a piece of the wall? <laughs> when it, when he didn't did. that day, but eventually when the wall, because, you know, that was in the 80s still, the wall came down in 1991. Um, and so at that time, he couldn't exactly go up and chisel at the wall. Um, but he did make a return trip to Berlin um, in the mid 90s and took a chisel to that wall and tore it down. But again, here's a man who so many credit as tearing down that wall and having such great influence, but he really believed that it was the people who had been oppressed were the ones that really made the change happen. He believed that when people got a taste of freedom, they couldn't help but want more. And so he saw that he had maybe planted a seed and played his little role, but that it certainly wasn't his doing, but it was the people who so, had made that happen. So did he impact people outside America? Absolutely. Well. I think he did. I certainly think he did. And if you look at his global influence and, you know, you talk about how, how God orchestrates perfect places and timing and brings people together. I mean, I look at this incredible triad of influence that happened during the 1980s. So you had Ronald Reagan in the United States. You had Margaret Thatcher in the UK. You had Pope John Paul II um, coming out of Poland, of all places, um, and leading the Catholic Church. All three of them were putting pressure in different ways on the the communist system. And all of them had unlikely rises to power. All of them had had assassination attempts. And so you see God's hand leading these three unlikely people to power, not only to serve their own regions, but also to be this triad of influence for good that really, I think, led to a lot of pressure on the communist system. For all that he did, though, he also recognized them because he was very quick to say that Gorbachev was a good man too, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. You know, he he was willing to play that balance. He put a lot of pressure on Gorbachev um, politically, socioeconomically, militarily. Um, but at the same time, he allowed him at some point a gracious exit, which which I love because he backed him into a corner just far enough and then allowed him to graciously exit. And so Gorbachev, I think, is is looked to with greater fondness, maybe even than is deserved because Reagan was gracious in allowing him to save faith and um, deliver greater freedom for his people. Now, you can probably answer this question. Is it true that President Reagan was a left-hander who was made to become a right-hander? Because I, I'm a left-hander, and it's one of those terrible things, I've got the worst writing in the world. 
Is it true that he was? It like is that? true. There you go. It is true. He was a lefty naturally, and so when he rode horses, when you know we're Americans, and he's a cowboy, so he liked to shoot guns, you know, out on out on the ranch and stuff. But most things he did, he did left-handed, um, except he did write right-handed, and he never really liked his penmanship because he thought it would have been better had he been allowed to be a lefty. But it just an interesting fact. There's a higher proportion of presidents of the United States who have been left-handed than in the general population. So maybe you're in very good company. <laughs> yeah, I've always, always seen myself as a potential American president. <laughs> I don't think so. But did he write a lot with his, with his, with his left hand then? He or never was, wrote with no? his left hand. He okay. always wrote with his right hand. But he did write a lot. And in fact, I used to laugh because sometimes he would write these beautiful handwritten letters to people. And he would bring them to my desk and say, Peggy, can you type this and mail this? <laughs> and I would look at him and think, respectfully, sir, I think they'd probably rather have this copy. And so I'd make a copy for the files and then mail this beautiful handwritten letter. But he was one to regularly take pen to paper and say what he wanted to say, how he wanted to say it. It was important to him to have that personal connection. And he kept up with people back from his days when he lived in the Midwest, from his governor days, all the way through his presidency. He was a great pen pal and a great correspondent. We have national prayer breakfasts in mm -hmm. New Zealand and Australia these days. Now, that, that is something that he was involved with in America, right? Absolutely. He was the first president to recognize a national day of prayer. And that was something that was very important to him. And he believed that, you know, he was never apologetic about his faith, but he believed that in America we have the right to worship or not as we choose. And so it was never something he forced on anybody else. But at the same time, he was never apologetic about what he believed and was very vocal in articulating his faith, his belief in God, and his belief that God informed his steps and that he sought God's wisdom in the decisions that he made. So in his latter years, was he a churchgoer? He was. So as president, he would have loved to go to church, um, but the Secret Service and the disruption to the other churchgoers was a little bit difficult. So post-presidency, when he came back to Los Angeles, he did attend church very regularly, except for when he was traveling. He and Mrs. Reagan would go up to Bel Air Presbyterian Church and attend it very regularly. When he wrote the letter to the American people and announced that he had Alzheimer's, it was interesting because things really changed and it became very much a circus atmosphere at church. Everybody wanted that picture and they wanted to see him in a, a state that was less than statesmanlike. And there was even members of the media who would sneak into church with their cameras to take pictures in church. And it just became too disruptive to the other parishioners. And so the decision was made for him not to go to church and attend publicly anymore, which was very heartbreaking. But, you know, as a Christian, I felt like that was one of the reasons maybe that I was put there. And so I made sure to reach out to his pastor and his pastor would come in almost weekly and sit with him and bring the church bulletin and give him a little vignette of the sermon and read scripture with him and pray with him. And I think especially in his final years, that that was a really important part of his faith journey, being able to be continued. That must have been a terrible moment when you heard, when everyone heard that the president had Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember? It was devastating. I do, of course. Um, Maybe there was some blessing in the sense that we really didn't know that much about Alzheimer's then. There wasn't information. There was just this idea of it's dementia or senility or Alzheimer's, but there really wasn't the knowledge that we have now. And so maybe that was better that we didn't quite know what we were marching into. They actually think that Ronald Reagan's mother probably had Alzheimer's, but back in the day, they didn't identify it as such. And so they think there was a genetic component to it. But it was, it was very scary because you didn't know, you knew things would change, but you didn't know how much and how quickly and would I be able to support him through those years? How would that go? How would he be? How would he feel? And so a lot of unanswered questions during those years. You worked very closely with him. Mm -hmm. Did you know before anybody else, were there any signs that gave it away? Yeah, I knew something wasn't quite right, um, but again, I didn't have a name for it. I mean, now if we heard the signs and symptoms that I was noticing, we would say, oh, Alzheimer's. But we didn't know it then. We didn't have the luxury, and we only have the luxury of knowing about Alzheimer's because Ronald and Nancy Reagan took something that was very private and painful and personal and came public with it. And so we have them to thank that now we know those warning signs. And so at the time, I knew something was off, but I also knew I worked for an elderly gentleman who did an amazing job at the level he did every single day. And so I knew something had changed, but I didn't know what it was. How did he tell everybody? 
Well, he wrote a beautiful letter to the American people. And the way that I found out is the day before it was released, um, the chief of staff called me into his office and handed me the letter, the beautiful handwritten letter, and had me read it. And so that was how I found out. And then was part of a very small staff that the next day released this letter to the world knowing that the outpouring that was going to come back. And you know what, what was amazing during those years is he was five years into his post-presidency. He wrote this letter to the American people. And for the next five years though, as the world is saying goodbye to him, I'm pretty much saying good morning to him still every day. And so this outpouring of grieving and emotions and letting go of him maybe was a little premature because he was a cheerful warrior and continued to champion on as best as he could, as long as he could. And what a great example of living a life full throttle all the way to the end. Did he know? That he had Alzheimer's? He did. He did. And that was something that was probably hardest for him because he knew that eventually he wouldn't know, but he knew that Mrs. Reagan would bear the brunt of that. And he and Mrs. Reagan had such a beautiful relationship. He knew it would be very difficult for her, and he he was very sad and worried about her in that. Did he blame God? No. You know, it was interesting because there was almost this peaceful, calm, and surrender. Um, and part of me wanted to say, Mr. President, fight it, you know, fight it, fight back, don't surrender. Um, but he believed that God had ordered his days and God had led him every step of his path all along his remarkable life. And so why, when God had taken care of him all this way, would God turn his back on him now? And so he really believed that that had to have been part of God's plan. And we see now the beauty and the good that has come as a result of him being able to share that. But he had to have been very brave to, to step into that moment, knowing that things would change so drastically. Would you mind reading just some of that letter that he wrote and then gave to the American people? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to if I can get through it. <laughs> it was very heartfelt and he was, he was somebody who loved to write. He loved to say things how he wanted to say them. And so this is just a beautiful letter from his heart. Exactly he, he, what, he, he wrote this, right? He wrote this and there's a beautiful handwritten copy. Um, what's interesting is he, he was such a great writer. It was usually one one writing all the way through, never a mistake. At the very end of the letter, there's one little cross out on the letter, um, which I think is a little symbolic showing this man who so many people had revered as, you know, the, <laughs> the Superman on the world stage, showed that he was in the end very human. So. It's dated November 5th, 1994. My fellow Americans, I've recently been told I'm one of the millions of Americans who will be afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. Upon learning this news, Nancy and I had to decide whether as private citizens we would keep this a private matter or whether we would make this news known in a public way. In the past, Nancy suffered from breast cancer and I had cancer surgeries. We found through our open disclosures we were able to raise public awareness. We were happy that as a result, many more people underwent testing. They were treated in early stages and able to return to normal, healthy lives. So now we feel it's important to share it with you. In opening our hearts, we hope this might promote greater awareness of this condition. Perhaps it will encourage a clear understanding of the individuals and families who are afflicted by it. At the moment, I feel just fine. I intend to live the remainder of the years God gives me on this earth, doing the things I have always done. I will continue to share life's journey with my beloved Nancy and my family. I plan to enjoy the great outdoors and stay in touch with my friends and supporters. Unfortunately, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, the family often bears a heavy burden. I only wish there was some way I could spare Nancy from this painful experience. When the time comes, I am confident that with your help, she will face it with faith and courage. In closing, let me thank you the American people, for giving me the great honor of allowing me to serve as your president. When the Lord calls me home, whenever that may be, I will leave the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Thank you, my friends. May God always bless you. Sincerely, 
Ronald Reagan. Phew. You all right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And he did make a huge difference when that letter went out because people sort of really rallied to him then, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. And it was one of those illnesses that was very stigmatized. There was a lot of shame affiliated with it, you know, something people couldn't control. But most people who had Alzheimer's were kind of put aside and kept out of the limelight. And, and in fact, it's, it's interesting because I had a great aunt who had Alzheimer's disease that I knew she was something wasn't right, but we never used the word, and she had pretty much been hidden from me a lot of my life. And so it was something that a lot of families suffered in painful silence. And having somebody like Ronald Reagan come forward, I think really gave them power and confidence and certainly led to eventually resources and additional information about the disease. Why is it, do you think, that so many people wanted to meet him, shake his mm -hmm. hand, even just look at him. Yeah. I think everybody kind of had a feeling like I did. When he looked through the camera lens and came into your living room, you felt like he was speaking directly to you. Um, one of the blessings of having published this book a couple of years ago, I get to travel the world and tell my stories. But one of the things I love is that I get to hear other people's stories too. And I love hearing the stories of the people who say, I met Ronald Reagan in an elevator and he shook my hand and he looked me in the eye. And for that moment, I felt like I was the most important person in the world to him. And so he had this great way of connecting with people, of making people feel seen and valued and heard. And he, he always spoke to people, not above people, not beneath people, but right to them. And that resonated with people. And that was genuine. That was exactly how he, he presented himself because that's how he felt. And time and time and time again to hear people say, I met him and for that moment, it was a special moment I'll never forget. If my mum was still alive, she'd want me to ask this question. She would say, Gary, ask her, was the president good with children? Because that's <laughs> always, a, always a good yes, sign, isn't it? Yes. Um, so I'm very fortunate to be a proud mother of four children. And my children literally grew up at the feet of Ronald Reagan. And they got to come to the office and go to the president's house and went to the zoo with him and swam in his pool and celebrated Christmas and birthdays and all kinds of occasions with him and got to be visitors in their home quite a bit. And the interesting thing about kids is, they don't care if you're the president. They don't care if you're important or wealthy. Kids know one thing. Do you like them? Do, do, you feel, do they welcome you? And my kids grew up knowing that Ronald and Nancy Reagan loved them and cared about them and enjoyed their company. And in fact, I'd kind of get in trouble with Mrs. Reagan sometimes because if I came to the house without the kids, she we'd visit and then at the end she'd say, well, Peggy, it's nice to see you, but I haven't seen the children in a while. <laughs> you know, kind of that little hint she was dropping. So I would bring the kids up there quite a bit. And uh, my husband got to play golf with the president as well. And so just to have these real moments with real people behind the scenes was very unique and very special. I grew up with Ronald Reagan. I, I started working for him in my 20s and stayed connected um, with Mrs. Reagan until her passing in 2016. So. 27 years of my life um, was connected with these wonderful people. What do you think is the biggest difference that President Reagan has made to the world? Freedom, freedom. He brought freedom to places in the world that had been written off. He saw a vision for what the world could look like. And he made a lot of great changes domestically. You know, it's interesting because you look at his domestic policy and out of everything that was accomplished, all the stats, all the economy, all the numbers, all of that, if you asked him at the end of his eight years what he was most proud of, he'd say, I'm most proud that I made the American people believe in themselves again. So it wasn't about the policy, it wasn't about the astronomical numbers that he accomplished. I made the American people believe in themselves again. And so I think he saw himself on the world stage as a freedom fighter. Could he plant those seeds of freedom in places that could then be cultivated by the people of those countries themselves? Could he talk to world leaders that maybe we had ignored for decades prior and sit down face to face? He believed in face to face diplomacy. There was nothing that couldn't be accomplished if two people sat across the room from each other and talked to each other. And so I think he brought down a lot of walls, not just the one that went around Berlin. But So there's the story that I don't know whether it's true, you can maybe uh, tell me uh, that a lady came into his office and actually got down on her knees and, and, and kissed his feet. Could that be right? Yeah, yeah. I was there that day when you talk about a powerful moment. And this was a moment when 
there was no media there. The cameras weren't rolling. Nobody was watching except for me because that was my job to, to always watch. And this little woman came in very elderly, very hunched over. She was from Romania. And she walked into the office and took one look at Ronald Reagan and dropped to his feet and started sobbing and kissing his feet. And the president watched her for a moment and then brought her up to stand. And with tears streaming down her face in this very broken English, she looked up and she thanked him for freeing her and her family and her people from oppression. And somehow this little lady in Romania had traced the dots of her freedom back to this man's feet. And I thought of all the people all over the world who if they had had the opportunity would have traced the dots of their freedom back to this man's feet. And what a humble, gracious man he was and what an incredible man of faith that was unafraid to step onto the world stage and step into a place that people think is typically godless and toxic, the political arena, but was willing to be used by God and to stand there and to not only inspire people, but to actually bring freedom to places in the world that hadn't known it before or hadn't known it for a long time. Peggy, at his, at his funeral, mm -hmm. um, obviously people said lots of lovely things. Yeah. Did he get a chance to talk into the, the hymns that were played at his funeral? And if yeah. so, what did he choose? Yeah. So we, I actually write about in my book, um, a, a slightly awkward conversation. You know, you have to walk into the office one day and say, Mr. President, I'd like to talk to you about your funeral. <laughs> A little bit of an uncomfortable conversation, but for any president in the United States, I mean, they have a plan that's in place. And so we would revisit it periodically just to make sure it reflected the wishes of what he still wanted. But yeah, he was very influential in picking scriptures and picking songs, great hymns of the faith. One of his favorite was the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I love that because in that song, there's this beautiful convergence of patriotism and faith that are very intertwined. And so that was who he was, and that's who he always was. You couldn't have pulled his faith out of him, nor could you have pulled his love of country out of him. It was woven into the very fabric of who Ronald Reagan was. Yeah, and he was the president who often talked about we the people from the Absolutely. Constitution. Yeah. We the people tell the government what to do, not the other way around. And he always believed, even as president, it was not about him. It was always about the people and could he bring voice and light to the things that were important to him and be a champion for them. That was his goal and his role. Peggy, thanks for chatting. <laughs> it's lo Thank lovely you. to meet you. And we want to finish the program with a quote. We're just going to, we're just going to put that up on, on the screen now. And I think this says a lot about President Reagan, the man. And again, yeah. Peggy Grandy, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes from him. It was from one of his last formal public speeches that he gave. And I love what he says because it encapsulates his view of what he wanted history to say about him. Whatever else history may say about me when I'm gone, I hope it will record that I appeal to your best hopes, not your worst fears, to your confidence rather than your doubts. My dream is that you will travel the road ahead with liberty's lamp guiding your steps and opportunity's arm steadying your way. The political arena, as we know, has so much fear and toxicity in it. How wonderful that somebody could appeal to our best hopes and to our biggest dreams. And Ronald Reagan certainly did that. God bless you. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.